Hello, everyone. My name is Melanie, and I want to tell you my story about how I ended up behind bars. Yes, this is not a joke. I actually got to a real prison, and at the same time, I'm not some kind of dropout or a troubled teenager. I'm an ordinary girl with the most standard hobbies. But why did I go to prison then? By mistake? No. There was no mistake. I'll tell you everything now. My life has developed so that I am the only daughter in a single-parent family. Mom and I lived together, and I never knew what it meant to live with my father or who were our grandparents, aunts, uncles, etc. We never had anyone. I don't even know if it's a good thing or not because I've always just taken it for granted. My mother had a very difficult fate. She grew up in an orphanage and saw a lot of cruelty. So she's not a very simple person. She had a difficult disposition. She can be too strict and sometimes even merciless. But I'm used to that too. She is my mom after all. Besides, I don't have any other relatives. Anyway, I remember when I was a child, my mother could punish me for accidentally overturning a plate by locking me in the bathroom without a light or making me go hungry all day. Once, while serving another sentence in pitch black darkness near the toilet, it seemed to me that there was some kind of monster nearby. I was very frightened and started knocking on the door and begging my mother to let me out, but she was adamant and did not even come to me, although she could perfectly hear my suffering. After that incident, I realized that asking for mercy was useless, and it's easier just to accept it. Fortunately, this did not happen often because I always tried to be a good girl and knew that my mother should not be upset. Well, when she didn't have anything to be angry about, she was much more bearable. However, over time, I saw her like this less and less often. By the way, what position do you think a powerful and unprincipled woman like my mother can occupy? Well, of course she's not a teacher a child doctor, or a psychologist. She's in a women's prison. In my opinion, that's quite logical. Some time ago, my mother and I had an argument. She forbade me to go out with my friends for a whole week, saying that I didn't deserve to go out. Honestly, I can tolerate a lot of things, but I had a lot of plans for this week. I had to go to my best friend's birthday party, visit my physical education teacher in the hospital, and go to an exhibition. But since my mother didn't hear me at all, we had a conflict. In the end, I said I would no longer follow the prohibitions that are beyond my understanding and would still do what I intended. I also added that I would no longer allow her to punish and humiliate me for the slightest mistake. When my mother heard this, she was shocked. She tried to grab my arm and lead me to the bathroom, but I pulled away. Then my mother was furious and said that she would still find justice for me and that I too early imagined myself as an adult and independent, but I was sure that all these were empty threats and that nothing terrible would happen. The maximum I was counting on was another day-long hunger strike, but I was so used to them that I didn't care. However, after two days, I was in for a shock. It was just when I was going to a friend's birthday party, the police stopped in front of me on the street, and then everything happened so fast that I couldn't even understand it. They ran out of the car, handcuffed me, and put me in the car. On the way, I tried to explain that it was all some kind of mistake, and that I was actually underage, so I should be let go. But they didn't hear me at all. Out of desperation, I even tried to pull away, but in vain. They continued to drive me somewhere in silence. After about an hour, we stopped in front of a very scary building, surrounded by a fence with barbed wire, and then I looked at the sign and realized that we were at the entrance to the women's prison. Then I became completely scared, and I even began to cry from helplessness and horror. Then I was taken inside the building where they gave me a prison uniform and told me to go change into it. By then, I was crying bitter tears and shouting that this was all a terrible mistake. But everything was like a scary movie. 
No one reacted to me, and my words seemed to fly into the void. And I had no choice but to obey. Soon I was sent to a cell with three women who were clearly three or four times older than me. They looked at me angrily and then said that now I was the youngest of them and therefore I would have to follow all their orders. Oh no, not again. I just ended my mother's dictatorship and now these three? I thought it was only then that I realized, Mom, Mom works in one of these prisons. Maybe even this one. It looks like this is her trick. Did she put on this whole show just to teach me a lesson? But how is that possible? And has she not gone too far? However, I still had some doubts and continued to watch what would happen. The night was ahead, but I was very afraid to go to sleep. And as it turned out, not in vain. As soon as I laid down, I felt a strong pain in my back. Getting up was more painful than going to bed. So I just rolled off the bed, falling to the floor. The women, meanwhile, were watching my misery maliciously as it turned out. I had laid down on a pile of broken glass. And personally, I had no doubt that it was the trick of my cellmates. Then I started screaming and calling for help. And soon I was taken to the infirmary where my mother was already sitting with a stone cold face. At that moment, there was no doubt, and everything finally fell into place. But why would she do that, and hadn't she gone too far? A moment later, the police came in and handcuffed my mother, and I was sent to the street where an ambulance was waiting for me, and some people were crying and trying to hug me, but they were completely unfamiliar to me. So I had to ask them to take their hands off me. The ambulance gave me first aid, and then they said that they would take me to the hospital. But first they asked me to meet someone. Then those crying people came back into the ambulance, a man and a woman, and they rushed to hug me. But now they also called me daughter. But what does it all mean? And then the woman showed me a photo of a married couple with a newborn in their arms and said, this is me, and dad, and you our daughter. And to get me out of my stupor, they hurried to explain everything to me. It turned out that 12 years ago, I was kidnapped. My parents did not know where I was and what happened to me. This was done by my mother, or rather, the woman who I considered my mother. She was also my biological father's ex-wife. After the breakup, she couldn't accept the fact that he had remarried and had a daughter, so she decided to take revenge in this inhumane way by kidnapping me. Now, do you understand why she was always so cruel and cold to me? And in my opinion, it's good that she did not kill me, although I think she could have, or maybe even tried to, and it was just an accident that saved me. The fact is that my parents would have never found me if this crazy woman hadn't put me in jail when I was in prison, one of her colleagues could not remain silent and reported what was happening to the prosecutor's office. They found out that I was not her daughter, and in fact, I had been wanted for a long time. That's what saved me at that moment. I have been with my own parents for three months. I feel real love and care for the first time, and this is all very new for me. I'm not used to being treated kindly but I hope that I will soon join my real family. What do you think would have happened to me if the woman who kidnapped me hadn't screwed up? Right? Your version's in the comments. Click on the thumbs up button under this video and subscribe to our channel. Hi, I'm Valone, and I would like to share with you my story about a drone chasing me. You will be able to understand me as if a fly has been following you at least once in your life. In my case, it was almost the same, but the fly was huge, and apparently it was controlled by a human. But who exactly was this? In short, I noticed the drone about two months ago, because it was hovering over me and then flew by a hundred thousand times. But something tells me that it was present in my life before. 
because I clearly remember that for a long period of time, I was awakened by the buzzing of a fly, which I couldn't find anywhere. And only later did I realize that my chaser was buzzing in exactly the same manner. Since my parents and I live in our own house, and we have no neighbors within a radius of 500 meters, we spend a lot of time outside, especially during good weather. We hang out in the courtyard of the house, cook food in the fresh air, lie on the hammocks or sun loungers, play outdoor games, or just read our favorite books while sitting on a swing. One of these days, I was doing my homework and sitting at a table on the veranda when I suddenly saw a drone. Well, I didn't immediately realize what it was. It took some time to identify the strange flying object. But when I got it, someone was playing with a drone. I don't know how legal this was, but I thought its appearance was a one-off event, so I didn't attach much importance to it. In fact, dozens of planes fly over us every day, and that's okay. But the annoying drone didn't leave, and it continued to hang out right above me. In addition, it became clear that it was here not by accident, but because it was either hovering exactly above my head or would circle around me. I felt uncomfortable, especially considering the fact that at home, I was all alone. What if these were robbers who were trying to figure out whether it was possible to get to our house, or even some psychopaths who would shoot me using this flying thing? In short, on that day, I went inside the house and stayed inside until my parents came home. So I didn't know if the drone was still there after I went away, but I was scared. So I shut all the blinds and closed the windows tightly. However, this was only the beginning because from that day on, the drone began to chase me everywhere. I went to and from school under its escort and walked with my friends. Not to mention the fact that it was waiting for me at the exit from the shopping center. Soon, my closest friends can no longer imagine me without it. It really annoyed me. My parents and I even turned to the police. But as soon as the officers came to our house, there was no trace of the drone. Therefore, we were advised to find out its serial number. And only after that, they complained to the law enforcement agencies. But no one said how to do that. My parents and I began to sort out all the possible options regarding who this could be. We remembered whose way we could stand, and were thinking of whether any of us had any enemies. But all of our theories were falling apart one after another. In the meantime, the drone literally drove me crazy because its buzzing was in my mind around the clock, and I could no longer understand whether the devices was next to me or not. But soon, it went even further, apparently to finish me off completely. I was walking to school along a deserted road where it was rarely possible to meet other people, when suddenly, the drone hovered right in front of my face. It was really unexpected because it had never gotten so close to me before. I tried to get around it several times, but every now and then, it was stuck in my way. I don't know for how long this game lasted, but it sprinkled some liquid right in my face. It felt like water, but I was sure that it was some kind of poison, so I went straight to the hospital. I was shouting and asking to call the police and immediately studied the liquid that was on my face. But the doctors looked at me as if I was crazy. Fortunately, the police and my parents arrived there very quickly, and together we managed to get an expert examination carried out. According to its results, no traces of any substances could be found on my skin. And according to the doctors, it was water that was splashed onto my face. But I never believed this. And I didn't doubt it at all that there was something poisonous in the liquid. Since that day, I could neither sleep nor eat. From time to time... I was gripped by panic and was choking with despair because it seemed to me that death was inevitable. And when the damn drone appeared above me, I was literally torn apart by horror because I did not know what else to expect from it. 
What if it decides to set me on fire or gouge my eyes out? I don't know anything about who is behind it, especially considering that a couple of times there were some containers with unknown substances hanging on it. The worst thing was that no one could help me, neither my parents nor doctors or police officers. And every day, every hour, I was closer to going crazy as I felt my sanity disappearing. At some point, my dad said that it was time to put this to an end, and he decided to figure out everything on his own according to his plan. I left the house and sat down in a rocking chair to read a book. Immediately, the drone appeared and started hanging out over me. But my dad was ready for this. So less than a minute and the cursed flying object was knocked down by a stone, released from a slingshot. By the way, in order for everything to go smoothly, dad had been training for about a week. And in the end, he managed to make an incredibly fine and clear shot. When the drone crashed, we immediately called the cops and took a bunch of photos of the drone, along with its serial number. And it was the right thing to do, because the crash flying machine caught fire and began to melt right before our eyes. Apparently, it was programmed for self-destruction in case of the defeat. But the most important thing is that we did everything in time, and within an hour, the police found out who was behind all of this. That is who started this investigation who controlled the drone, and who was scaring me to death. Then another shock awaited me, because I had never expected to hear that name. The violator turned out to be my paternal grandfather. In fact, he was always really strict and demanding, constantly keeping his family under control. But when his children grew up and his wife died, He did not want to lose his influence, and he tried to get his own way in the families of his children as hard as he could. Thus, his daughter, my aunt, moved away from him to another continent, but my dad remained. My grandfather always tried to dictate his strict rules at our home, but once my father strictly, but once my father told him strictly that if he did not stop making our lives miserable, then we would have to protect ourselves from him. And honestly, it seemed that my grandfather had changed. He didn't bother us with moralizing anymore. He did not tell anyone what to do, and he did not invade anyone's personal space. We were sure that Grandpa had changed a lot, and we're really happy about this fact. Because of my stupidity, I even began to trust him, and once told him that I had met a group of extreme cyclists who were performing really incredible stunts with the help of their two-wheeled friends. I was delighted with them with their courage and their professionalism and was literally torn by emotions. So I told my grandpa about my new friends. Probably in the old days, my grandpa would have locked me in a dark room and would have forbidden me to leave the house for a whole year while prohibiting me to eat sweets and play with the cat. But now he remembered the conflict with my father and just said that such people would bring me a lot of trouble. And then he came up with the whole drone idea. For some reason, he had decided that if I got scared of the flying chaser, then I would certainly think that this was a trick of my new friends who love extreme things. And I would stop talking to them as if they were daredevils. And I'm a good girl in his eyes. In short, my grandfather almost drove me crazy. And he believes that he did everything right for educational purposes. Do you think my grandfather did the right thing to me? Give your answers in the comments, click on the thumbs up button, and subscribe to our channel. A small convertible sports car rumbles down a desert road, kicking up a cloud of dust high into the air behind it. The driver is sharply dressed and looks at himself in the rear view mirror, giving his sunglasses a slight adjustment. He knows he looks as good as he feels. And why shouldn't the producer of Hollywood's ninth most successful film in the month of September be happy? The car comes to a sudden stop in front of a cluster of buildings, which appear to be the only structures in this vast, otherwise empty desert. The producer hops out of the car and surveys the desolate location. The cracked concrete airstrip, the weather-beaten buildings, the endless, lonely desert stretching on for miles in every direction. This place is great, 
the producer says out loud, to no one in particular. The whole location would be perfect for his new movie, which is set entirely at a desert airstrip and tells the story of a lonely airplane mechanic who falls in love with a female bounty hunter catching an escaped convict. A tale as old as time. But now where's the guy who called him? He kept rambling about wanting to make a documentary about the desert or something, but that doesn't matter now. He doesn't realise what a great filming location he's sitting on. The producer calls out, Hello! But the only response is the desert breeze. He takes off his sunglasses and looks around. He sees that the doors to the hangar are cracked. Maybe the guy who owns this place is in there. The producer walks inside the hangar, but abruptly stops. His mouth goes agape. He can't believe what he's seeing. This place is even better than the guy on the phone had described it. The hangar is huge and completely empty. He could probably build almost all the sets in the hangar, maybe even shoot the entire picture out here. He'd save a fortune on the budget by not having to pay the soundstage rates that the studios charge on the movie's lots in LA. You beautiful geniuses, he thinks to himself. The movie could flop and still be a financial success. But where's the guy who called him? Doesn't he know who he is? He's a very important producer and doesn't have time to wait around for some desert nobody. All right, that's it. He's leaving. The producer turns to leave, but the door of the hangar suddenly slides shut with a bang. Is this some kind of joke? He walks up to the hangar doors and starts banging on them, but they don't move. Hello? Hey, I'm trapped in here. What's the big deal? Still no response. But just what is going on at this place? The producer is getting worried. Was this some kind of setup? Is he about to get robbed? It wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if they took his car. He's nine payments behind on it anyway. But jeez, is it hot in here. It was hot outside, but it's even worse in this hangar. And whoever said that desert air was dry? An idiot, that's who. The humidity here is stifling. The producer loosens his collar and tugs at it, trying to cool off. All right, I've had just about enough. If you don't let me out of here, there's going to be big problems for you, fella. Just then, the producer hears a noise behind him, coming from the dark deeper in the hangar. The producer doesn't react, though. He needs to play it cool. He bends down and pretends to tie a shoe and takes the Derringer pistol out of his ankle holster. He stands up and spins around, pointing the gun in front of him, but he can't see anyone in the darkness. This is your last chance. I'm not playing around here. The strange noise comes again. A low rumbling noise, and the producer stumbles forward. What just happened? It felt like the floor ripped and pushed him forward. There, it happened again and again. The producer screams. What's going on? The rumbling, growling noise grows louder as the floor keeps ripping and pushing him forward, like a wave rolling through the solid ground. Is this an earthquake? The producer is knocked off his feet, and still the floor keeps pushing him forward towards where the horrible growling noise is coming from. He tries to stand, but he can't. The floor is moving too much. He tries to crawl, but keeps getting moved closer and closer to the source of the now deafening roar that seems to be coming from... What is that? The producer screams and fires his gun at the thing in front of him? In the flashes of the gunfire, he can finally see it. The thing he's being pushed into. A giant, gaping maw filled with a mass of gnashing, grinding teeth. How unlucky for this movie producer that he didn't realise until it was too late that the location of his movie would be the last one that he'd ever scout. Because as you have probably already figured out, this unknown building in the middle of the desert isn't all what it appears to be. And in fact, is quite well known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-1051. SCP-1051 isn't actually a building at all, but in fact is a large living organism. This creature's shell, which resembles an aircraft hangar, is quite large and measures roughly 700 meters by 500 meters by 60 meters. It is a completely immobile organism and acts as an ambush predator, luring its prey to it through a number of different forms of sociological and psychological manipulation. 
SCP-1051 attempts to bring prey to it in a number of ways, but its primary method is by spreading certain ideas into popular culture. It will constantly try to connect orbiting satellites and use them to beam out television signals, images and other forms of media. It's been measured as having around a 25% success rate in connecting with and getting its message carried by the satellites. And it may have the ability to transmit regular radio broadcasts or connect to standard telephone lines as well. The messages that SCP-1051 sends out tend to fall into the category that could be termed as conspiracy theories, most of which are about itself. It has uploaded information to various conspiracy websites that has included reports of spaceships being held and reverse engineered in its hangar, descriptions of so-called men in black using its location. It has uploaded information to various conspiracy websites that has included reports of spaceships being held and reverse engineered in its hangar, descriptions of so-called men in black using its location as a site for extraterrestrial contacts. It has attempted to spread rumours that it is a site used as a testing location for any number of top-secret devices, including energy weapons, weather control devices, teleportation machines, and impossible propulsion systems. SCP-1051 has also attempted to spread through radio and television transmissions that it is called a site used by a United States shadow government. It's made at least a handful of calls to Hollywood-based production companies in an attempt to get them to further spread its information, as well as contacting various tabloid newspapers. Perhaps, most nefarious of all, it has even sent orders to US military intelligence operatives, posing as a senior official and ordering them to reveal SCP-1051 appears desperate to make its location known to curious outsiders, all in an attempt to get them to come find it so it can lure them inside of itself and feed. And the anatomical structure of SCP-1051 is perfectly suited to this task. Its bizarre biological structure consists of a large tongue which looks very similar to a paved runway. The tongue leads directly into a set of large airplane hangar doors that could be called the organism's mouth. This door mouth opens up to what looks like a hangar, but is actually the gizzard-like organ of 1051 where it grinds its prey into a fine paste to prepare for digestion. The next building is the creature's stomach, where it breaks down the liquefied prey into nutrients and separates the waste products that it can't digest. The nutrients are transported to the area where SCP-1051's brain is thought to reside. While the waste is ejected out of the structure, Finally, there are what appears to be a set of antennae on the side of the building. These information distribution organs extend below the ground as well, where many more antennae and wires are thought to exist and give 1051 the ability to send out multiple television, radio and other signals. SCP-1051 was discovered in 1947, when an egg-shaped structure was reported to have crash-landed in the desert of the American Southwest, near the town of Roswell, New Mexico. The United States Air Force took this strange egg into possession and moved it to its current location in Nevada for observation and research. The Air Force scientists who were assigned to the object first thought that they were dealing with a meteorite, though one that was composed of some yet unknown material. They soon discovered that the object was hollow, and was filled with some kind of liquid. Strangest of all, though, was when they detected something inside that liquid core, and it was moving. They studied the object for years, until one day something happened that would end their research for good. The egg hatched. One night, as Air Force Sergeant Burson and two scientists, Dr. James and Dr. Gold, were going about their regular work analysing the object, they heard a strange sound. When they looked at the object, they saw that a crack had begun to form on the outer shell. This cracking continued for about five minutes until something finally broke through the shell. An alien creature began to emerge from its shell and the men all turned to run. But something reached out with a long tentacle-like arm and grabbed Dr. James. It pulled the scientist in and seemed to absorb him right into its body. 
Sergeant Burnson and Dr. Gold managed to escape the airline hangar and send out a distress signal. It was this cry for help that described an attack by an alien creature that would put the object firmly on the SCP Foundation's radar. As Sergeant Burson was sending out the distress signal, Dr. Gold tapped him on the shoulder and pointed towards the hangar where the egg-like object had been stored. The two men watched as the hangar bulged and expanded. The hangar suddenly collapsed and they watched as the creature looked to writhe around in the debris. But then a new shell began to form around the alien. It grew larger, expanding and shifting until suddenly it took on nearly the exact form as the hangar that once stood there. SCB Foundation agents arrived at the site not long after and took control of the area. They discovered almost immediately that the building-shaped creature was anything but dormant. This extraterrestrial that had been born from an egg and then taken the form of an airplane hangar was ejecting its own eggs. The building would occasionally blast eggs up into the sky. Several of these eggs were stopped and reclaimed by the Foundation. But others managed to slip past and escape the Earth's atmosphere, making them impossible to recover. The Foundation also soon detected that radio signals were being emitted by the hangar and set up a small radio nearby which would allow them to both receive and send signals back to the creature that was now designated as SCP-1051. Dr Richardson, the Foundation researcher on site who was leading the investigation into 1051, found the frequency that it was transmitting on and attempted to speak to the creature. After asking if 1051 could hear it, the creature actually responded, and it seemed to have a very simple request. Give! When Dr. Richardson asked it to elaborate, asking, Give what? 1051 responded, Want feed! Bring food! When the doctor told 1051 that it wouldn't be getting any feed, the anomaly immediately sent out a new transmission, stating, Area 51 is currently being controlled by the SCP Foundation, a shadow government organisation that has designated it SCP-1051. Here are a few names of the operatives. Dr Richardson cut SCP-1051 off and ordered a D-class personnel to be sent inside the creature, hopefully appeasing it and stopping it from sending any broadcasts out about the highly secretive organisation. When asked why it was sending these signals, SCP-1051 responded that it was trying to make humans curious. It appeared that its hunting strategy was to flood the world with conspiracy theories, conspiracy theories about itself. This would then cause interested humans to come explore the location, and once they entered the hangar, their curiosity would reward them with an encounter with the alien that they had been seeking. SCP-1051 also explained that the eggs that it was ejecting were its babies, and it seemed quite upset that the Foundation had intercepted some of them as they were on the orbital escape trajectory. But where had SCP-1051 come up with these conspiracy theories? Had it been studying our culture and the boom of science fiction in the 1940s to make up stories it thought would lead people to it? Foundation researcher Dr. Richardson had a hunch that there was something else going on. He next spoke to Dr. Gold and the other Air Force scientists who had been studying the egg-shaped meteorite. He asked him to describe SCP-1051's first victim, Dr. James. Dr. Gold told him that Dr. James was obsessed with his job and that spread into his personal life. He was a real sci-fi nut. Dr. James apparently loved B-movies, especially ones about aliens and UFOs. He was convinced that the government had both in their possession already and his research on this strange egg-shaped meteorite only added to his confidence in that fact. Had SCP-1051 somehow absorbed this knowledge from its first meal here on Earth and it was now using it as a way to lure in new, inquisitive prey? Dr. Richardson thought it may go even deeper than that. When he played a recording of the first conversation he'd had with SCP-1051 for Dr. Gold, the one where 1051 told him it wanted to bring food, Dr. Gold was left shocked. 
The voice he was hearing belonged to Dr. James. SCP-1051 remains in the Nevadan Desert, and its area is patrolled at all times by no less than 20 foundational personnel in uniforms that represent those worn by members of the United States Air Force. They are authorised to shoot at intruders, but not with the intention to kill, instead only as a means to scare them away. Should any intruders come within one kilometre of SCP-1051, they are to be detained and administered Class A amnesiacs. Since SCP-1051's primary danger stems from its ability to spread false information, the SCP Foundation's main containment efforts have been focused on stopping its broadcasts. Agents are to respond to any civilian rumour or questions about SCP-1051 with denial and ridicule, to make it clear that these are nothing but stories and that the person is stupid for believing them. Should they exhibit any knowledge beyond the normal myths and rumours, the application of Class A amnesiacs is also permitted. Any satellites orbiting near 1051's location are to be monitored for interference to their transmissions. And if any antennae with an unknown purpose are discovered within a 10 km area of the building, they are to be destroyed or surrounded by a far day cage. SCP-1051 may not be able to move, but its ability to reproduce and the difficulty that the Foundation still faces in stopping its spread of disinformation has led to it being classified as elusive, and research into its origins and biology are ongoing. Now, for another anomaly that you never want to step inside, go watch SCP-002 The Living Room, and be sure to subscribe as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.